All right, hey everybody, it's Dave Kramer, the Critical Thinking Christian, <laughs> and I'm uh, recording this for the second time because uh, I I got a word. I've been drinking pale ale. Okay, and the word pseudopigrapha, pseudopigrapha, it still doesn't sound right to me. Pseudopigrapha. That's what. How do you say it? Pseudopigrapha. Uh, which, which is, uh, you know, meaning that it was written by someone else. Okay. I want to talk about the pastoral epistles, which are first and second Timothy and Titus. Now these, uh, were attributed to Paul. Okay. He wrote these to the churches to instruct the bishops and, uh, give pastoral guidance. But over time, uh, they're no longer accepted by most New Testament scholars, and they consider them to be pseudepigrapha. And uh, um, Burton Mack, uh, Burton L. Mack, uh, he died, uh, I think, in uh, 2022. Uh, he wrote a book called Who Wrote the New Testament? And what he says is, the three pastoral letters were written at different times, undoubtedly during the first half of the second century. Their attribution to Paul is clearly fi fictional, for their language, style, and thought are thoroughly unpauling. The personal references to particular occasions in the lives of Timothy, Titus, and Paul do not fit with reconstructions of that history taken from the authentic letters of Paul. Okay, now... I was thinking about that. I never really thought of uh, the way authors write, but if you read authors, I mean, back when I was younger, I read uh, a number of authors. I read uh, Stephen King. I read pretty much most of his books back when I was a kid. And his style was always the same. His style never changed, okay? Even with different, you know, topics. Where with uh, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, the style changes. It is, uh, from what I remember, yes, it does have a different uh, flavor to it, you could say. Um, uh, Bart Ehrman uh, in Forged uh, shows... Uh, um, shows that uh, the author of the pastorals used words that Paul does not seem to have known in his undisputed epistles. Okay, in 1921, the Brit British scholar A.N. Harrison wrote an important study of the pastoral letters in which he gave numerous statistics about the word usage in these writings. One of his most cited set of numbers is that there are 848 different words used in the pastoral letters. Of that number, 306 or more than, than one-third do not occur in any of the other Pauline letters of the New Testament. That is an inordinately high number, especially as about two-thirds of these 306 words were used by Christian authors living in the second century. That suggests that this author is using a vocabulary that was becoming more common after the days of Paul, and that he lived after Paul. Okay, now. Uh, <clears throat> most modern New Testament scholars dismiss the tradition of Paul as the author of the pastoral epistles, to the point that many writers, such as in the New Oxford and Annotated Bible, no longer feel obliged to give specific reasons for this view. Um, let's uh, look up here. The New Oxford Annotated Bible Prologue is correct in stating the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are pseudepigraphical. 
not written by Paul. Now, I'm going to stop here and just smile because I got through that. I got through this word right here without messing up. Uh, and, of course, he states about Bart Ehrman here. Okay, most scholars are convinced that Paul could not have been responsible for the vocabulary and style, the concept of church organization, or the theological expressions found in these letters. Having ruled out Paul as the likely author of these epistles, we must try to learn what we can of the real author, because the author wished readers to believe that the three epistles were written by Paul himself some decades earlier. He was careful to leave us no clue as to his identity. Now there, there's, there's a, there's a problem. The Bible is apparently inspired by God. These authors, like say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. Now, you know, you know, we have uh, what's his name, uh, Daniel. There's, there's lots of uh, skepticism as to the authenticity of those, the authors of those books. Plus, having been written, what, 40 years later? You know, if it's inerrant, oh, and some people will say, well, that doesn't mean that, that. It doesn't mean that it's inerrant in everything it's just inerrant in the uh the message uh, well i'm i'm sorry but uh <laughs> if if a god inspired this and a god told the, these authors to write this down i mean why couldn't there have been a scribe going along with jesus and writing all of his words down you know i mean I mean, we, we, what, years, decades later? But uh, all we can really infer is that the author wrote during the first half of the second century and probably lived in the Greek-speaking Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean region. Uh, the first assumption is based on the references to second century concepts such as overseers or bishops. Okay, yeah. I mean, the words change. I mean, you just have, I don't know what, uh, you have different peoples coming in. I mean, and, you know, different concepts. And then words will change due to whatever influence comes in. I mean, I'm like I said, I am not, you know, a, an expert on this, but over time, how things have changed. I mean, we still use certain words, but the way they're, they're spelled, the way they're, you know, may, maybe even, uh, uh, vocalized, verbalized, you know, um, you know, but, uh, let's see, uh, let's see. The first assumption is based on the references to second century concepts such as overseers or bishops. On the analysis by Harrison, uh, Francis A. Sullivan says in From Apostles to Bishops, page 15, that the consensus of scholars, including Catholic ones, is that Rome did not have bishops until around the middle of the second century. So a Roman Christian would have been less likely to have written as if the appointment of bishops was an established fact. The epistles addressed and locations are convenient fictions. So they tell us no more about where our author lived. We can never know the name or any personal details about the authors of these epistles. So the author essentially lied he was disingenuous he i guess you could say yeah like bart ehrman in his book forged uh these were forged and christians read these and 
say, well, that's what we got to do because that's what God told Paul. Well, no, God didn't tell Paul. Now, I have another one here where this person is talking about, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read the conclusion here. He says, I do not find Harrison's conclusions to be as firmly grounded as he does. That is not to say that I affirm the pastoral epistles are unquestionably 100% Paul's writings. This work does not provide evidence which casts doubt on such a proclamation. Yet the evidence presented fails to take into account the relative paucity of the volume of the writings and the composite comparisons made to other writers, such as Shakespeare. I made a comparison to Stephen King, such as the declaration that the vast majority of the work are not of Paul's origin, that only a small section of 2 Timothy may be rightly credited to him is unconvincing. Uh, so where does this leave us? I neither confirm nor dem deny Paul's authorship of those letters. I remain with doubts in my mind and have not seen any evidence presented here or elsewhere to push me off the fence on one direction or another. Okay, so that, that person doesn't, is still unconvinced and, and in doubt. But yet we're told that these are Paul, the letters of Paul in a Bible that's inspired by God. What I'm, what I'm trying to get here is that one, once again, we have doubt, we have confusion. Uh, some are, are convinced, uh, quite a few are convinced that it's, it's forged, that these are uh, pseudepigraphical. And uh, this is supposed to be of God. And uh, as, as someone who was a former Christian and believed everything, 100%, you know, literal and whatever, you know, uh, this here is more reason to believe that what I did when I deconverted was the right thing to do. And, you know, back in the day, uh, people didn't, didn't know, they didn't have uh, the internet. They didn't have uh, access to information like we do now. Now we have the access to in information and we're, we're bringing this Bible is, you know, being brought into doubt more and more. So that's why I decided to make this video. I'm not a scholar. I just, I'm, I'm you know, uh, just, uh, you know, parroting what other people say, but it, it's, uh, if, if you're a Christian and you just blindly believe, you know, you, you need to rethink that. You need to look into this. Maybe you will be convinced that your uh, position is correct. Or maybe you will be able to sit back and go, you know, there's something wrong here. And, you know, what I need to do is I need to rethink this. I need to look into this. And you're going to find a lot of crap. Okay. So I hope that that helps. You know, like I said, I am not a scholar. <laughs> uh, but uh, like I said, you know, I'm going to do what I can to bring out more. Uh, um, oh, one thing I want to do right now, I just remembered it, is you remember when God said uh, that man should not, not make any graven Im image of anything on earth or in heaven or in the sea or wherever? And then he instructed his... Uh, people to make cherubim images of gold on the Ark of the Covenant? Isn't that a contradiction? I just love to hear the way Christians have to mental gymnastics their way through that because that's what he did. Don't make any graven images. Now, make graven images on this uh, box here where you're going to carry my uh, law that says don't make any graven images. 
<laughs> I mean, really? Okay. And that's it. That's all I have right now. I'm going to, you know, do some more research and come up with some other things and make more videos. But, you know, like I said, you know, think about it, you know, you know, do some critical thinking. That's why I named this channel the Critical Thinking Christian, because before I started critically thinking as a Christian, I believed everything. But there's so much doubt. There's so much contradiction. There's so many things that do not make sense. You know, so, you know, give it a try. Think about it. You know, look into it. And until next time, I'm Dave Kramer, and this is a Critical Thinking Christian.